Uh, it's, it's amazing is, is when, I, when I, I put together, begin to prepare a series, and I have, uh, even knowing that that series is what the Holy Spirit is having me do, the adjustments that he makes to what I thought it was going to be yeah. as we go. And so the passage of Scripture that I'm beginning with today uh, is, is right where I had planned to go today uh, in, in our, our series on Now Faith Is, and getting an understanding of how faith works and and why maybe it seems like at times it doesn't work. Uh, And so the verse we're going to go to to begin with, if you want to open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 17, is a verse I had planned to go to today. And uh, But just uh, in light of the things that were going on, there were some things the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and and took me down a a path, and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to change my message, what you're giving me. And he said, no, go back and read not just that verse that you were going to uh, use as your launching pad today, but read the entire chapter and then it, you ever have those moments where you get into Scripture and you're the Holy Spirit? It's like that, <laughs> like you, 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 your, your brain just goes into overload. And, and that's what it was as I was reading this passage. So I want to begin uh, here because especially this first part here, I need, I need to keep moving. Um, I, I believe we'll get out close on time, but if, I, if I'm a few minutes late, just need you to be patient with me today because this, is, this isn't something I can just leave off and come back to next week. And, uh, but I'm the one who shortened our service and put 15 minutes between services, so it's, <laughs> it's me that's got to do this. Okay, so starting in, in uh, Luke chapter 17 and verse 6, so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, now there's, other, there's another passage that talks about a mustard seed as well, but here it says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can not say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So a couple things in regard to faith uh, that they're talked about here in, in this verse. It says, if you have, if you have faith, so right, we read a verse uh, last week or the week before over Mark 11 about speaking to a mountain, and, and, and if you do so, and if you believe that it would be cast into the sea, right, the, the mountain would be moved by speaking from a position of belief. And I think that, uh, that sometimes we're, we are failing uh, in our speaking, and, and this is where I originally thought we'd go today, uh, but it will probably be next week now. <laughs> but a little bit is the idea that, you know, that when we, sometimes we're speaking and we're trying to muster up the faith as we speak to get something to move. Or we're speaking to something and thinking, if I, if I could just have a little more faith when I do this, it'll work. Or if I can, if I could... Uh, if I could reach down in there, and it actually is the verse right before this we'll, we'll address in a second, the disciples saying, Lord, give me more faith. Or could you, I just could, if I could just speak this with a little more faith, I believe it would work. Am I believing really hard faith? Yes, if I really <laughs> believe. Don't just believe, but really believe. <laughs> but you know what, what, when we read this, we find out that, that sometimes the mistake we're making in that is that we're speaking and trying to muster the faith rather than faith compelling us to speak. See, when faith compels you to speak, that's when we see things move. When we're trying to muster up the faith and add it to our speak, we're falling short. There's something in us that when, when, when faith, we, right, you, you know when, when you, you thought you got a scripture before, but now I get it. Of course, then you find out like months later that you still didn't even get it. Now there's even more to get. But in that moment, I got it. And something compels you. You, you, you can't even explain it. I know that I know that I believe that. And you couldn't, you, there's no way you can convince me otherwise. But there, there's those moments that we have. It's when faith actually compels you to speak. But that's when we see the kind of faith that Jesus is talking about when we can speak the things that were immovable and suddenly they move. Now we're gonna to get to a little bit uh, about this, this mulberry tree and why he uses that as an example here uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, but, but, you know, as, as I always do, and this is where the Holy Spirit took me on, on this this week, is context. Why did Jesus say what he just said? Right, because if you if you read it, you don't understand the context. In fact, you can read this whole first half of this chapter, and it almost seems like it's sort of just random non sequiturs. He's just saying things that sound very Jesus-y. <laughs> but 
Well, we can take, feel like the Sermon on the Mount. He's just saying stuff that needs to be said, and there's no rhyme. No, there's a perfect rhyme or reason to what he says and why he says it. Why? Because he's Jesus. Jesus isn't random. The word's not random. Right? The word was sent to this earth to, to fix the chaos and the randomness. Right? So, so when Jesus speaks, the, the words he chooses, the illustration he uses is important. And, and when we, we look at this chapter in its entirety, at least its first half, we're not going to go through the whole chapter, but this first half of the chapter, it tells us a lot about the context, and it's a context that is very relevant at this moment. So if we go back to, to verse 1 of this chapter, it says, Then he said to his disciples, and this is after he'd, he'd told several parables, and, and, and leaving people with, with really needing to think differently. He said to his disciples, it's impossible that no offenses should come. I love that Jesus has made it real for us. It's impossible that no offenses are going to come. Right? Sometimes we think, and then we even get either condemning ourselves or condemning other people because offense arises. What's going to arise is what do you do with it when it does? That's what defines you as a believer. That's what defines you as a person. What do you do when offense arises? So, um, but he's, he goes on, he says, he said, it's impossible that no offenses should come. Now remember, right now he's talking to his disciples. But woe to him through whom they come, or whom they do come. Right? So isn't the offenses arise, it's, it's the, the issue is, you know, Jesus is always getting at the root. He doesn't dance around the outside of things. I think a lot of problems we have, not just the current problems we're dealing with, a lot of our problems, they don't get solved because we're always just nipping out at the corners. You know, that, that we can look at the situation we have now and, and, and think, as maybe unfortunate we do, is we think it's been solved when everything quiets down. When all quiets down and all this violence and all this stuff goes away, can't we just get back to normal? You know, but the reality is the reason I believe that these things keep coming up because that's what we do. We just wait for it to subside so we can get back to normal. And, you know, when we don't deal, even in our own lives, personally, when we don't deal with the issues and we just kind of push them down and ignore them and, and think that it's okay because it got a little quieter, what does the enemy do? Right? He, he likes to pull back, you know, he, again, he is defeated, but he's not dumb. He's not God. He doesn't have unlimited resource. He doesn't have, he's not omniscient, not omnipotent, but he's, he's got a brain. And he knows how to pull the things we never dealt with out at the worst possible time. Right? And so we already have a nation that's, that's, that's struggling, that's hurting. And then we pull something up that's never been dealt with properly and pull it out at the worst possible time. And so I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm going to keep moving. But he says, woe to those who are those who are causing and bringing the offense. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Okay, so this little ones was the key to everything that the Lord unlocked for me in this passage. I don't know, I've read this before and I'm sure you've seen this before and you just assume it's, there must be some children standing around when he says this. And don't think much of it. Like, but again, if it says it, there's a reason. He pointed out the phrase little one. So, so I go and I start digging into the Greek and I pull out my Thayer's lexicon, as we all like to do. I know you all, look, <laughs> you just comb through the Thayer's lexicon. Yeah. <laughs> Probably if you want to fall asleep. But I pull it out. And, and so what, uh, what this will do is we'll show you not only what the definition of the phrase that was used here was, but it shows you what it is in that particular verse. Because right? it could be used in different contexts. And so here's what I found out this little ones meant in this context of this verse. It doesn't mean children at all. Those of little rank or influence viewed as inferior to other citizens. It was about that quiet in my room when I got that, when, that, when I read that. So what was Jesus doing? He was, you know, that you know, the, the, the situations we deal with, these are not new. Every society, every culture has 
one group of people that believes we're here, and there's another group of people that we view as here. Whatever, then the reasons change over time in every society, every culture, but, but it, is, it, is a, it is a consistent thing that the enemy does in every group of people. Right, so this is what Jesus is, is, is approaching here. And who is he talking to? He's talking to his disciples. Not because maybe they think of their, their position of following Jesus, but as we're going to find out here, is their position as Jews. And, 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 and stick with me. So then it says here that, that you would offend one of these little ones. Verse 3, now in light of this and then what he says, I believe that now he's turned and now he's talking to the, quote, little ones. Right now, now, Jesus never sees them as that, but their society did. So now Jesus, I believe, is now talking to them because he's talking to the other side of the, of the problem. So he talked to the side of the problem that's bringing the offense. Now he's talking to the side that has been offended. He says, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Right? Call it out. We need to. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you should forgive him. And then his apostles say to him, Lord, increase our faith. Right? I, that, that there was Jesus addressing, and I'm going to show you, it peels back a couple more layers. Okay, so you're like, okay, I see where you're going, Pastor. So you're just saying that, yeah, it's wrong that people are doing these things. It's wrong that we have uh, people who discriminate against another race so much that they would just kill them. I get it, but you, so, so you're saying, well, they're wrong, but we're just supposed to just forgive. We're just supposed to just not get offended about it. Well, pastor, we're way beyond that. Right? How, how are we supposed to do that with things that are going on? I'm going to tell you that what Jesus was showing is this is how things are supposed to work. When they don't, now we're going to have to go to phase two. When we haven't done those things, when those things haven't been handled properly, when, when there have been those who view themselves as greater and they have offended the ones that they view as inferior, and we've had this big mess and we've got to the point where, where, where in human terms, we can't forgive. Now, this is the thing is, is that, that I believe the problems that we have are, are problems that are because Man is trying to solve problems that are above his pay grade. Man think, we, we think that we can, and this, again, this is what happens in times like we're, we're facing right now, is that a bunch of people come out and they make a bunch of speeches, and then things quiet down, we think we fixed it. And we didn't. Right? Man thinks he can do that. And maybe then we can change a couple rules and change a couple laws and get some things done and feel like we accomplished something, but deep down we know we didn't. And I believe that, that what we see right now is an opportunity, because that's just how I think, as, as horrible as situations are, they are opportunities, is an opportunity to maybe this time get it right. Maybe this time, and I'm not going to say we fix the problems overnight, but we make some better decisions. And so, so here, the disciples now say, look at this and say, well, well, give us more faith. So then, now look what Jesus said. I want to read what he said again. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, right, really, really tiny, you can say to, the mul to this mulberry tree, now what's he talking about? He's, he's talking about the situation of this offense between parts of society and parts of culture that are at odds. And he's saying, this is a mulberry tree. You know what a mulberry tree, some things about a mulberry tree, that it, it has such deep and intricate roots. It doesn't blow over. You can't just pull it out. A mulberry tree, they say, can live up to 600 years because it has such deep roots. Right, so look at what we face. We have problems in this nation that have roots that are deep. And this is not an easy thing to fix, but, but Jesus' answer is speaking to mulberry trees. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to speak to mulberry trees. Not, not you know, this is the thing. We always got to remember the, our, our, our enemy is not people. Our enemy is the enemy. We keep attacking people. We don't solve problems by attacking other people. Now, people need to be held accountable for what they do. 
But you know, we don't solve the problem when people, when we view other people as the problem. The enemy is the enemy. There's some, there's some things that need to be spoken to. You know, that, that there's a lot of things. I mean, there's certainly a lot of emotion. There's a lot of, there's a lot of violence that I believe is, is distracting from, from solving the problem. But, but, it's, but it's also things that come out of a lot of frustration and a lot of anger that's been built up. But you know, the, if, if we don't get to, to getting Jesus' answer to solving his problems, we're destined to repeat them again. Well, and I think that's another reason he used the mulberry tree. There's lots of trees that have intricate root systems, but the mulberry tree specifically was very, very bitter. So right. you have an intricate root system with a bitter fruit. Right, and so now I want to, I want to, to, to read to you now what Jesus says, because again, I don't know how many times I've read this passage, and this next section is another great idea, but it seemed like maybe a non sequitur. Just another thing that Jesus has kind of thrown out there for us to think about, but this is all connected. Yeah. So we, now let's read verse six again. It says, so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots, be planted in the seed. Did you notice he said something different here? That, that the mulberry tree was to be planted in the seed. But it said the one who was causing the offense, now he didn't say they would be, but it was, he said it would be better than, uh, it'd be better if they had a millstone put around their neck and they were thrown into the sea, not planted. You know, I find it interesting, but he says this tree is planted. I think this is another place, just like where, where Jesus said earlier, it's impossible that there won't be offense. It's impossible. He's also real. You know, that, that we're, we throw around terms like as believers that we're supposed to forgive and forget. And then we, we feel guilty because we can't. Right? Forgive, but I, I can't seem to forget. Now, Jesus is being real here. This mulberry tree, it's, it's, it's over in a seat, but it's planted. It's still there. But it's in the seat. Right? I, and I'm not going to get, I promised myself I wouldn't get sidetracked to the seat today, but <laughs> it's planted. It's somewhere else but it's still there and it still exists. And we need the grace of God and we need faith to remember that that tree has been uprooted and planted somewhere else. It's not part of my life anymore. All right, but I wanna read this next section. This is verse seven. Now, in which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we're unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Okay, so again, you look at it and go, what, what did that have to do with everything else he just said? Well, there's this whole process here. So, so the first thing he said, he said, now, if you have a, he's talking about himself now as the illustration or, or God the Father. He has servants. Some of them plow fields and some of them tend sheep. We tend sheep. That's our job. Uh, that, that most uh, are out there plowing the fields. You're working the earth. You, you are expanding the kingdom outside these doors. Right, that you, you, are, you are doing, so, so he's covering everybody, whether you are the king or priest, whether you're the plower, whether you're the tender of the sheep. And he says, now you have a responsibility. So, so you've served and you said, well, I've, I've gone through, I've, I've, I have done my best to not offend. I've forgiven those who offend. And basically he's saying, good, you did the minimum. <laughs> That's what you were supposed to be doing to keep the mulberry tree from being here. If, if we were doing that, we wouldn't have the mulberry tree. But guess what? We got a mulberry tree. So, so now it is, it is our responsibility as believers, whether you're the plower of the land or whether you're the tender of sheep, to speak to mulberry trees. Yes. Not to, to, to not be okay with mulberry trees. To not be okay with it because we have a responsibility to speak to them and see them removed. And, and set off over to the sea. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're not profitable until we get to the point of moving beyond the minimum of what we're supposed to be doing. So don't forget the minimum, because we're supposed to be doing that. 
In fact, you can speak to mulberry trees all you want, but if we don't fix the offense problems, they grow back. We grow a new one. It may look different, but it's another mulberry tree. But now I want to take it, I want to take it even further. Good, I'm doing good on time. You're doing great. I'm doing great, okay. So then, just as Jesus would always do, is he's going to show us faith in action. You know, faith without works is dead. We can talk about what we believe all day long. We can all talk about doing these things. We can talk about, yes, I, I, you know, Lord, show me anywhere that, I, that I'm an offender. Lord, show me where I have not let go of offense. Lord, help me with my faith to, to be able to let go of an offense that in the natural seems like there's no way to do that. But, I'm not, but, but he's also telling us when I let go of the offense, it isn't like he knows, he gets it, that, that it isn't like it never existed, but I have to let go of it. Right, so, but after I've, I've done all that, and then I, I, I get in this process of speaking to mulberry trees, I gotta tear down some of these deep, bitter-rooted problems. So Jesus goes and does, does just that. Verse 11, now what happened is he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then he entered a certain village. There he met 10 men who were lepers who stood afar off. Okay, so I wanna stop for a second. So Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Now, you may not know this unless you look at a map of the area in that time, but from where he was to go to Jerusalem, it made no sense for him to go through Samaria. It was way out of the way. It made no sense. And in fact, his disciples would look at him and go, why, why would you go through Samaria? First of all, it's way out of the way. Second of all, I don't know if you knew this, Jesus, but we hate the Samaritans. Maybe you know, you've been in heaven. You didn't know we kind of got this thing here. We don't get along with them. <laughs> And so Jesus is about to show walking out what he told us to do. So I want to give you a little bit of history of, 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 of Samaritans, or, or at least to the best of my ability. You know, there's, 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 there's some conflicting theories about where the Samaritans came from. We just kind of read about them and go, well, they're the Samaritans, but where did they come from? Well, so I read about four or five main theories, but you know what every one of the theories had in common is that the Samaritans were not there by choice. They had been forced where they were through the series of different battles and skirmishes that depending on which one, whichever historian believes it was and which king it was, these people did not choose to be where they were. Now, they found themselves in the land of, of Israel in, the, in this kingdom. And so some of the Israelite people were willing to take them in and then brought them up in the ways of Judaism, brought them up in the ways of, of being a child of God and to where they consider themselves to be a brother or a sister. But did you know the establishment of the Jews never received them and saw them as second-rate citizens? They were, they were half-bloods. They weren't, they weren't real Jews, and, and so therefore they were rejected. Jesus goes out of his way to go find some hurting Samaritans, and he's proven a point. What was, what was Jesus doing? He was going to uproot a mulberry tree. He was going to speak to a, a rooted, a, a deep-rooted problem and go make a difference and go make a change. So he goes, and he finds these 10 lepers on his way. I don't know there was in, in Samaria, but it's important that he told us that he, he, made, he went out of his way to go to Samaria. Now it says, um, verse, I'll go to 13. So they lift up their voices and said to Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. You know, this is just interesting, that just how Jesus does things. He didn't come and lay hands and pray over each one. He just told them he wanted them to exercise some faith, didn't he? He said, just, just go and show yourself to the priests, which I don't know how much you know about, about the, the issues if you were a leper in this time. It's never a good time to be a leper. <laughs> really bad here. You weren't allowed in the city. You certainly couldn't go present yourself to the priest as a leper. Now on top of that, well, let's read the next couple of verses. It says, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, so he never went to the priest, 
with a loud voice, glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Okay, so just my opinion. Because of the culture, remember, he, Jesus has had this conversation with his disciples, so it was probably an issue. I think Luke reluctantly added, oh, yeah, he's, he was a Samaritan. <laughs> Probably didn't want anybody to know, all right, Holy Spirit said I have to write down he's a Samaritan. <laughs> and it's important that he was a Samaritan. Now, think about this. As a Samaritan, he could have walked away feeling he wasn't qualified for what Jesus just said. His, as a, even, in fact, to the priest, it may have been even more offensive for a Samaritan to present himself to the priest than a leper. If my qualification to receive the healing that this prophet or this, they called him master, what he just gave me means I have to go before the priest, I'm not going to get it. I'm second class. I don't, I don't qualify. But you know, Jesus is bigger than that. And so he looks and sees, wait, I'm healed. And he comes back and glorifies Jesus. Jesus answers him in verse 17. He says, were there not 10 cleansed? Where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Uh, King James Bible says, your faith has made you whole. And when you look at the, the Greek word used here, whole, well, it is this word we've talked about a lot here in the last couple of years, sozo. It is a complete and total healing. What was Jesus saying? Your faith has not just healed you of your leprosy, but it heals a lot of the other issues you were facing. That Jesus came, you know, Jesus comes to break down broken systems. And then he uses us to rebuild broken systems. You know, that, that he gave man dominion and authority on this earth. And, and just so you know, we don't usually do the right things. We mess up the systems. And so Jesus comes, and, and he'll initiate. He, he's the, the catalyst to, to break apart a broken system. And he wants to use us to rebuild them, to, bring, to put these systems in alignment with, with his will and his way. So Jesus comes here, and he recognizes a broken system. Jesus is, is, is there for all who are hurting, all who are in pain, all who are suffering. And here in this story, we find it was, it was that one who was rejected. You know, not rejected because he'd done anything, just by, the, by virtue of the fact that he was a Samaritan. And I, so I, find that, I found that interesting, you know, as, as, as I told you, as I, I had already planned to, to, to study out of that or teach out of verse 6 this morning, and, and I'll tell you that the thing that the, the Holy Spirit prompted me and kept sending me to is he just kept saying Samaritan. Samaritan, like, what? okay, Samaritan. I, I, well, he probably wants to talk about the woman at the well and her faith, and okay. No, it, it, it just all, the first part of this week, just, there's just a word that kept coming, Samaritan, Samaritan. So I said, all right, all right, let me go study Samaritan. Let me find out why the Lord is pointing me, to, pointing me toward this. And in doing so, found that this is a passage that is speaking to what we're dealing with. And that, you know, that there is no problem we face that God doesn't have an answer. That he hasn't given us the, the, the answer to do it. It's just a matter of whether we will do it. You know, we, we, are, in, we are in a nation, and, and, there's, and, and I ask you to stick with me this last part. I meant everything I say right now, you may not agree with, but that's okay. I hope you hear my heart. We have a lot of broken systems. There's a lot of broken systems in our, in our country. And I, I don't care what your, your opinion is. You know, I spent a lot of time this last week researching and learning. It's one of the things that we have to do is we've got to get information. And as I tell you all the time, you need to, you need to get your information beyond uh, wherever you get news or whatever you like to read because there's other information out there. And maybe you don't agree with it, but when you understand all the sides of an issue and all the places information comes from, you begin to put a whole picture together. And you know what? There's, there's a lot of debate about, you know, I, I, I can't for a second believe that those that would say that there are, there is no 
fundamental problem with systems in our country. It's just not true. That, that the idea, and, 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 and so I'm going to throw this out there because I, just maybe it's because of who I am. <laughs> when, I, when I saw stuff saying, you know, I don't hear any pastors using the term systemic racism, well, I'm about to. Right? It exists. Now, I don't, I, you, we can debate all day long about how it got started, why it got started, where, what's the root, what systems is it in. I'll leave that to the people who are probably going to comment on this and who knows what. <laughs> Just so you know, I'm not going to read the comments. <laughs> but no, it does exist. It's a broken system. There are things that are, that, are, that are messed up. And again, as I said at the beginning of this, we have problems that keep coming up because we don't fix the problems. And I'm not going to tell you I have the answers to how to fix all the problems. But I think we got to at least get to the place where we're willing to admit that there are problems. we got to admit that, that, that there are some things that just aren't right. That we have, we have people, fellow brothers and sisters in this country who are hurting and have been hurting because of systems that are broken. And this is not, I think one of the big problems is we make this a political issue. We make it a, a liberal conservative. We make it a, a, a Republican Democrat issue. And as soon as we do that, it's, it's like we, we've thrown out any chance of actually solving anything or fixing anything. We need to acknowledge that we have some problems. We need to, I, all I can speak to is, is the believers, of what we can do. We got to be doing what, what Jesus was doing, not just talking about it, saying, yeah, we got, there, there's some things we should have been doing that we haven't done right. We have, had, we have had people who have been offenders. We have those who have got caught up in the offense. Well, that's neither here nor there. It happened. And that's where we are today. And we need to be doing better about not spreading that any further. But now we're at a point, we got some mulberry trees we need to start speaking to. Or we have some things that we as believers have a responsibility, just like Jesus said, we're the servants. We're his servants. We have a responsibility to begin to, to speak. I don't know what that looks like. We all do it differently. You know, we kind of get in this thing where in cult, you know, our culture gets to be, well, if you don't speak out a certain way, that means you're not speaking out. I don't get into those things. We all have our place. Where do, where do we speak? What's, what's our sphere of influence? What's, what's our platform that we have to speak, to bring truth, and to more importantly, bring solution? It's Jesus. That's the only thing that can fix our, our problems. And if, if, we'd, if we'd have learned that earlier on, we may not be where we are, but again, we have another opportunity. We have another opportunity in front of us, in front of every one of us, that we have now an opportunity to do something with it. To not just hope it just goes away this time and maybe it'll quiet down and, and everything can just go back to normal. Because really when we have that point of view, we're forgetting that for a lot of people, that's the reason we have this is because their normal isn't what it ought to be. Their normal is not what a normal in America should be. This nation is better than this. We're the believers. We're the ones who have the power to do something about it. So I want to, to encourage each one of us, if you're watching, if you're here today, I don't know what that is for you to do. You know, I, and, and I struggle with that because you know me. I like to give you the, okay, now go, go do this, give you something specific to go do. But I will tell you this. Every one of us needs to be praying. Every one of us needs to be praying, whether it's you or you're praying for those voices to rise up to have answers to have solutions. And we need to pray off the, the, the attitudes that, that everyone keeps saying, we just need to sit down and have a conversation, but nobody can seem to do it because all they want to do is yell at each other. We do need to have conversations. We do need to, to learn about each other. We do need to, 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 to make progress in understanding that there's other points of view. We get so uh, ground into and digging our heels into what we believe and what we've, what we've learned. You know, we as believers need to be that catalyst. We need to be praying continually for our leaders. I don't care if you like a single one of them. Pray for them. They're, they're the ones we got, so we better pray for them. Right? We, we need to be praying for, for some, some good conversation. We, we, need, we need to be praying for, for uh, we need an end to the, to the violence. Right? We, we need to get to something productive 
And I get it that there's been frustration and it, and it escalates to that violence. But we need some solutions. And I believe that we as the body of Christ are gonna be the source of those solutions because we're, we're connected to the only source there is to solutions. So I wanna, I wanna pray as we're, as we're closing today. Pray for us as a church, as believers. Or pray for our nation and its leaders. And pray for those that are hurting. You know, when, when, when we have a, a, a police officer do what this one did, and unfortunately, this is not the only situation. This isn't the only time this has happened. It continues to happen. And we need to pray for changes to some of these systems. Right? That, that, that someone who does things like that, I mean, I don't want to get specific and start sounding political or anything, but you know, when, when, when a person does that and you find out there's a track record of people doing these things, why are they still out there? We need, we need to have systems that fix themselves when there's people doing things. Because, man, the vast majority of our law enforcement officers are there upholding the oath they took to serve and protect. But it's those ones that aren't, that we need to do something about. And, and well, I'm, I'm going to shut my mouth before I get myself in trouble. <laughs> Well, let's pray. I think, like you said, you know, Jesus came to fix broken systems. And this is a system that is broken. So as we speak to it, we expect complete wholeness, not just fixing the symptoms, not just so that it looks better on the outside, right? But actually gets to the root and fixes the whole system. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do, we come before you and we, we thank you for who you are. Lord, the, the places where we have tried to fix problems that we in our own knowledge of good and evil can't fix. Lord, we admit we can't fix these problems on our own, that we need you. We need your wisdom. We, we, need, we need your eyes of love and of grace and of mercy as the lenses that we look through all this through. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that, that it's just not now, it's in front of us right now, but that for, for, for literally generations have been under broken systems. Lord, I, I, I pray for them. Lord, we want to be part of the solution. We want to be part of what fixes these problems. Lord, we want your wisdom, your direction. We pray for our leaders. Lord, as we do, we do, we pray prayers of faith. Maybe on the surface we could think that praying, what difference is it gonna make? Look at who they are. No, we have to pray with a prayer of faith and belief and driven by a faith that you have said that if we will speak to these things, Lord, we will see change. Lord, I pray for, for voices to speak out, not just to point out what's wrong, but to bring voices who have answers. Bring voices that have answers that have come from you. Lord, I thank you for, for you for you coming in as, as you've promised us. If we humble ourselves, we pray that you would heal our land. Lord, we pray and we ask for you to heal our nation. You would use us as your, your people, your hands and your feet to bring that healing. But Lord, we know it's gonna come from you. Lord, I thank you for just new ideas that are gonna come. For, for new direction, for, for, for the, the, the cleaning of house that needs to take place, the, 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 the things that are broken in systems in our nation to be fixed, to be repaired. We just thank you for this. We thank you for that direction, Lord. We know, we, we do stand and we believe as we speak to this mulberry tree, it will be uprooted, it will be cast away. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. What to before we, we close this service is I want to make sure that I provide you the opportunity to receive Christ as your Savior. You know, that's, that's really the only thing that's going to have massive change in this world is the more people who receive not just religion into their life, but receive Jesus into their lives. Receive his Holy Spirit into your life. And so we want to pray a prayer. It's based on what it tells us in, in the book of Romans, how we receive the gift of salvation, that we acknowledge Christ with our mouths, confess who he is, and believe in our hearts that what we're saying is true. That's all that's required. People have believed that, oh, I have to clean up my life or get some things right or make up for some things before he'll receive me. No, you can't do it. That's another one of those lies of the enemy. He wants you to think that you have to do it. You can't, but he can. 
So you invite him into your life. All those things you need cleaning, he'll help you with it, and he does it way better than we do it. So let's pray. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. And I ask you, dear Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died for me, and you rose again. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you pray that for the first time, please uh, drop us an email or something and let us know. And the only reason I ask you to do that isn't because of anything for me. It's really because Jesus said this. He said, if you acknowledge me before men, then I'll acknowledge you before my Father who is in heaven. It's an important step just to tell somebody you've made that decision. And boy, we would just love and be super excited to hear about that. And then I would tell you, get connected to a church. If you're in our area local, we'd love to have you be part of our church family here. We'd love and we'd accept you. But if it's not, find yourself a good church. Get connected. You need that fellowship. It has nothing to do with whether you go to heaven or whether God accepts you or whether he'll bless you or any of those things. But it's about growing and about having that fellowship, getting around other people that, hey, we're not perfect, but we're trying to move in the right direction. And that's a good thing to get around is people who are moving in the right direction. Amen.